Good morning. This is Tuesday, February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Um, down here in southern Vermont, we had a tough ride to work. Um, <laughs> I had to go out and shovel about eight inches of snow before I could get to the newspaper. That's, that's the full extent of my walk this morning. Good thing Campion wasn't on the front page. I know, poor thing. Um, he's in Montpelier, probably sitting in my seat. Um, <laughs> I, I sent him a text asking him not to mess it up. So I always keep mine clean and his is always messy. Um, today we're dealing with S18. It's an act relating to limiting earned good time sentence reduction for offenders convicted of certain crimes. Um, I did receive a letter from an offender named Sean Breyer, and I will just mention that he did send me this letter vehemently opposed. He's an offender who would be impacted by this change. Um, he feels that. Um, I'm just, um, he feels there's a over sentencing as a result of um, plea deals where prosecutors overcharge, and that's created a um, increase of long term inmates in our prison population, requiring contracts with private prison companies for supplemental housing. And uh, says he understand attorney general's perspective and the feelings of those who have been victimized. I disagree that a victim's long-term term and expectations from a flawed plea deal negotiation process should exclude these offenders from demonstrating their rehabilitation while incarcerated and earning some credit for it. Uh, basically the letter from uh, Eric um, where are we? Um, uh, maybe I should hear, we, maybe we should hear from Matt first. He sent an email to us suggesting that there'd definitely be litigation where we to pass S18. So I don't know if you want to share that with us, Matt. Um, oh, sure. I mean, this is something that I, I brought up, um, or relatively early on. And this was uh, honestly the basis when there was a change in good time, um, you know, what, 10 plus years ago, um, maybe, maybe more than that during the Douglas administration where all good time was eliminated. The individuals who were under the various forms of good time at the time um, had a vested right in receiving the good time that they, um, under the systems that they had. Um, and the only way that you could start a new system, basically that had no good time attached to it, was to either allow the existing systems to continue going forward and allow them to earn it, which would have been very unwieldy, um, or to do what you did do, which was to grant everybody who had um, a right to good time under the then existing statutes, um, the good time that they would have received had they earned it. And that's what you did, is that you so-called so trued up um, the good time system by awarding everybody um, under whatever system was available. There was a time when there was good time off the min and the max. There was a time when there was a uh, good time only off of the max. Um, and then there was the elimination of good time. And, and I believe actually there was a third iteration where the, the numbers were actually different. Now at the time it was 10 days um, per month, and and I'm doing this in gross terms, so that you so you know so that we don't have to get too much into the prison math, 
for yeah. a thir 30 days, 30 days served got you 10 days. Um, so it was basically a one third reduction in your sentence. Um, and depending on what system you were on, it's off the min and the max or off your max, um, except for the people who were um, had life in prison cases, um, you know, like, uh, as, as your, as your maximum, um, the others were getting, uh, it off the, off the minimum. Um, in any event, you trued everything up. Now, as of last year, when you passed the bill to grant good time under the, our constitution, which is, and has been interpreted many times regarding the application of laws to criminal defendants and um, ex post facto application. Um, the, uh, there's a statute um, that sets it forth and says that you pass a statute that gives grants rights to particular individuals. Um, if you then subsequently change that statute um, to take away that right into the future, you can't take away a vested right that you've already granted to the people who are um, in in uh, in the facility or in in the jail. If you're, as far as uh, for example, in this case, it's good time. So when you passed the statute last year, you granted everybody who was under sentence the right to good time. Right now, it doesn't matter if you wait ten years or if you wait if you wait ten days. Um, all of those people in, during that snapshot period of time until there's a change have a vested right in that good time. Um, and so uh, going forward, you can change the law and say, well, we're not going to allow good time for people who are uh, sex offenders and, and, uh, and murderers, just to use you know, gross terms rather than the specific crimes. Um, but all of the people who are already under sentence for those things right now um, have a vested right in that uh, that you can't take away uh, because you made that change last year um, and under the constitution and your statute in the statutes, uh, it's one, what is it? One, two, 14, Eric, um, title one, two, 14, section two, 14. Um, they, uh, I had written this all out and I actually, I was working on some budget stuff, so I don't have that right in front of me. So I'm just basically discussing this with you without those notes. In any event, um, whatever you do now is going to only be applicable to the people who get un go under sentence going forward. It's not going to apply, uh, well, frankly, to any of the victims folks who you have uh, coming in and testifying that they don't want this to occur, it's going to apply to future victims. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's actually so little dispute about this that the last time you went around doing this, um, the legislature just granted everybody all of their good time going forward without ever having them earn it. Now, in this particular case, I don't think that that's really what you should do if you want to change the law. What you should do is identify the relative small handful of people of whoever, you know, if you limit it to aggravated sexual assault and first degree murder and aggravated murder, um, then you are, um, you know, you have a very small universe of people who this is going to apply to. And then going forward, um, it will, uh, you know, you can do, do what you want to do uh, without impacting the rights of the people you granted this right to uh, when you passed the statute last year. Uh, uh, Senator Baruth has a question, but, um, and then I have a follow-up. Senator Baruth. Okay, Matt, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding you. So we've been talking about the bill as if, if it were to pass, there would be a uh, there would be a, a group of people who received good time under the bill we passed two years ago or, or last year, whenever it was. A couple months ago, yeah. A couple of months ago. And then their good time would stop on the passage of this bill. No. Okay, so that's my question is, 
we've we've been proceeding as though that were a, a possible path. You're saying that that's just on its face uh, impossible or illegal. Correct. Okay. Just wanted to but, make sure I. But but may I ask? So my understanding of what we're doing here. Um, was to limit it, and, and we can argue about who it should be applied to. Um, I think that's still to be determined in the, in the discussion, too. And I, I'm not sure that the list of crimes we have is the right list. But um, let's just say, for sake of argument, it's the small group you just described, aggravated, uh, aggravated sexual assault, murder, and so forth. Um, they were sentenced with no good time, right? Right. So correct. That was that's mm -hmm. the but 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 so it, what you're arguing is that once we've granted this, we've automatically given it to them, and, and we can't take it. We can't change that. Correct. Is that your argument. I mean, the, the other group, the group you're talking about, the group you're comparing, had already been sentenced with the understanding they were going to get the good time. This group's been sentenced with the understanding they weren't going to get good time. So right, I see it as you, somewhat different. What, what am I missing? Well, what you've done is you've granted them a right. You've improved their situation. You've, and once that applied to them, you can't take it away. Um, that's the that's the point um, and that's what the you know if you take a look at uh, 1 2 14 and the constitutional cases that support that that's what the basis of of that is um, so you know I know what you're I know what you're saying as far as the the equity of it you know is it is it fair for someone who didn't have an expectation 20 years ago um, to have, have it given to them and then taken away. Well, what the law says is if you vest a right in somebody in a criminal case um, relative to their sentence and punishment, um, you can't subsequently take that away um, ex post facto, even if you do it during the, during the interim period. It wouldn't matter if it was, uh, if, like I said, you know, if, if, if what you had done, just done, you waited five years and then changed it. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's the same issue because they'd be operating under that five year period of time. We're not taking just away the, what the thing that makes everybody anxious about this is that it right. just happened a couple months ago. Yeah, but we're not taking away whatever they might gain between now and the actual passage of the law. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I wonder if we could hear uh, Senator Nitka. Eric had a comment, but then I wanted to ask something too. Are, is, um, are you saying, Matt, that based on the law that went into effect on January 1, everybody in prison, including you know, murderers, all those people, are right now falling into that category where they would have a vested interest? Unless they have yes. life without parole. <laughs> Correct. Unless they have life without parole. Right. Eric, did you have a comment? I was going no, to call I'm, on David Sure. No, I was just pointing out that, that the statute was uh, on your webpage so that Matt was referring to the fact that he didn't have the language in front of him. But in case you want to look at the language while you talk about this, it's uh, Peggy posted it. Good. Good for Peggy. Uh, thank you, Peggy. Uh, now I got to get to the webpage. Hmm. Uh, yep, Tuesday, February 2nd. Don't thank me, Eric sent it to me. <laughs> uh, 214, um, general provisions. Okay, uh, David Sure, any comments? I'm sure the Attorney General knew about this. Yes, Senator, it is something that we had thought about uh, in, in drafting the law. And we understand, of course, that the 
inmates who are incarcerated now uh, who, where to whom this change may apply uh, may file suit, and that may even be the uh, obligation of the Defender General's Office to pursue that. But um, we do not believe that the law, um, that there's a sort of once granted all, you know, once given always, always uh, held right. Uh, we read the law differently than that, and uh, we think that any lawsuit that's filed is not likely to succeed. Let me explain that a little bit more. There's two um, related but not identical concepts that the uh, Defender General is discussing here. Uh, one is the prohibition on ex post facto laws, uh, which is a constitutional prohibition uh, in the U.S. Constitution and certainly one that applies to Vermont. And the second is the statutory provision in 1 VSA 214. Again, they have a similar operation, but um, one's statutory, one's constitutional. With respect to the constitutional limitation, it's important to understand what exactly it is. Uh, and then we can explain why this proposal doesn't is, is not applicable. Or I should say why ex post facto concept is not applicable to this proposal. I'll read you uh, a one sentence definition, uh, one of many in, in Vermont case law describing ex post facto laws. Uh, so this one is in, in, Ray, in Ray Blow from 2013, I believe it says, a prohibited ex post facto law is one that is or is applied in a way that is both retrospective and more onerous than the law in effect on the date of the offense. That last clause is essential. It is the key to the discussion we're having today, which is that what matters is what the law was on the date of the offense. What we're doing here in, in this law is we are not changing anything that was in effect on the date of the offenses that this law would apply to. By definition, these would all apply, by definition, both of last year's law and, and this one. These are all offenses that occurred and were sentenced before the change in the law. So bringing what this law proposes to do essentially is put offenders back in the same position that they were at the time of the offense. They are not, this law is not making any punishment more onerous. Uh, it is returning to the state of the law at the time of the, uh, of the offense. In fact, in, you know, it's, it could give some people a slightly better uh, outcome because we are allowing the, um, you know, that, that which they are accumulating right now, potentially accumulating right now, that good time that they're potentially accumulating right now, they could, they could hold that. So they might even be in a slightly better position than they were at the time of the offense. But that's the key concept here is we are not going back and changing um, and making more severe a punishment uh, from, you know, that was in place at the time of the offense. And that's what ex post facto, ex post facto laws are uh, applicable to. Um, and that's the key difference also with the earlier earned good time change. There, the, the issue, the, one of the main problems, and there was a, that was a very complicated change. There was a bunch of problems there, but one of the problems with respect to ex post facto was that you were potentially changing um, somebody's punishment and making it more severe than it had been on the date of the offense. Uh, and that would not have been uh, allowable or constitutional uh, because they, it's, not a, it's not an open and shut case, but there's clearly inmates would have had a strong argument that they were uh, potentially um, being exposed to more severe punishment. I think that argument was a likely winner and, um, and the legislature couldn't do that. But again, that's not the case here. This is this, the, you are returning people to the same position they were in at the time of the offense. With respect to section 214, um, or yeah, so uh, section 214 of title one, it's a similar issue uh, that, that the provision that's applicable to criminal offenses in that is, I'll say frankly, not written in a way that we would probably write a statute today. It's a little bit confusing to follow, uh, but I'll, I'll read it quickly and then explain, and there's a, there's a case that uh, explains it a little bit more too. Um, it states, the relevant provision states that, and when I read this, listen again to the last clause of what I'm saying, because that's the key here, but I'll read the whole sentence. If the, if the penalty or punishment for any offense is reduced by the amendment of an act or statutory provision, 
the same shall be imposed in accordance with the act or provision as amended, unless imposed prior to the date of the amendment. And that is a key uh, distinction here with respect to a 214. And there's a case, I believe it's um, uh, State v. Barron from 2011, that explains that final sentence a little bit further and says, um, um, the, the, sorry, State v. Barron reads, uh, the, the sentence at issue here in State v. Barron was imposed prior to the date of amendment. Um, and State v. Barron basically says, you know, that is the key, key clause here, uh, the key relevant clause, and that would be the same in these cases too. These are all uh, sentences that were imposed prior to either of the statutes we're talking about here. So 214 wouldn't apply because, uh, again, the sentences were imposed prior to the date of amendment. Um, so it's our read that this is, this is you know, squarely lawful. It is not placing anybody in uh, forcing them into greater punishment than they faced at the time of the commission of the crime or at the time that they were sentenced um, to, de to the degree that that is the more relevant inquiry under 214. Uh, and I think the case law um, states that plainly. I, I was somewhat tempted to ask Judge Gerson if he wants to weigh in, but my guess is he'd prefer not to give us his ruling at this point. <laughs> it uh, sounds like it, it might come our way, uh, Senator, depending on <laughs> what you do with this bill. So I, I will not offer an opinion at this time, but thank you. Well, thank you. Um, could, Matt? Could I just... Yeah, please. I appreciate what uh, Dave Sher is uh, talking about, but he misses the key point of what 214 is talking about. Um, if you read A, sub A under 214, the amendment or repeal of an act or provision under the Vermont statute shall not revive an act or statutory provision which has been appealed. And then under B, the amendment or repeal of an act or statutory provision except as provided in C below shall not, and then you look at two, okay, because this is not a new sentence, but affect any right, privilege, or ob obligation or liability acquired, accrued, or incurred prior to the effective date of the amendment um, or appeal. And so what's going on here is you guys last year um, granted a right, privilege, right or privilege um, and that right or privilege vested in the defendants, uh, in the people who are under sentence. Um, and as a result, if you subsequently change that, um, you can't take it away for those people who are, who are um, subject to that right being uh, vested in them. And so it doesn't have to do with a change in their penalty or um, punishment so much under C but as to a right privilege, right or privilege that is that is has been granted to them um, by your statutory change last year, so I do agree with uh, uh, Judge Grierson completely that he will, he or his minions will uh, have the ability to uh, uh, take a look at this, and we will see what happens. But just you know, to let you know, if we pass the bill. Uh, yeah, we have this one teed up. I appreciate that, Matt. Um, Senator Baruth. Uh, Matt, I'm just wondering if you can respond specifically to David's um, unless clause, um, that, that last clause that in both cases he had us focus on. What's, what's your specific answer to that piece? That has to do with the penalty or punishment for the offense, not to the right, right. granted in good time. Oh, so, yeah. so you aren't changing a sentence. You can't change somebody's minimum or maximum sentence. Um, but what you've done is granted good time, which is not a minimum or maximum sentence. It's a right that is outside of the sentence itself. Because oh, there's no guarantee of it. Well, we could not withstand 2014, right? I don't think you can do that. <laughs> well, but, you can't. We can withstand a lot, not withstand anything. 
I, we wrote yeah, the law. Yeah. I guess we could repeal it if we wanted to. I think it's constitutionally based. What this, what I think 214 did is take the a collection of uh, um, ex post facto uh, case law and explain it um, in the statute, which is what you know. Sometimes you do to clarify um, or organize case laws as they come down over a period of time. Understood, but I, I don't know why we couldn't not withstand it, not withstand a lot of things. Well, David, did you want to comment on notwithstanding? Uh, yes, Senator, a couple, couple comments, and I certainly uh, understand that um, uh, that the Defender General's Office has this teed up, and courts will be weighing in on this, so our, our discussions here today will be uh, repeated later, but I, I did want to, I do think First, to answer your question initially, yes, I think you could uh, do a notwithstanding. This is a statute. It's up to the legislature to treat it how it will. And um, to the extent that it is constitutionally based, and I agree with Defender General Valerio that, that aspects of it are certainly constitutionally based. Um, I've already, we already discussed why it's our reading that the ex post facto provisions don't apply to this. Um, a couple of things I'll just say briefly, I, and again, I understand we're, we're wading into the waters of statutory interpretation um, deeply that will be uh, waded into again in more detail in court, but I would just note a couple things. One, that you know the subsection, uh, subdivision B that the Defender General pointed to um, notes that that subsection applies except as provided in subsection C, which was the subsection I was reading from. And it's our read that subsection C is what would be applicable to um, a criminal offense. We, we, we read the statute to, to apply that way and we believe the case law has applied it that way. That being said, if for, assuming for the sake of argument that subsection B might apply, which again is not a read that we have of the statute, um, we would say that when, when the statute says affect any right, privilege, obligation, or liability acquired, accrued, or incurred prior to the effective date of the amendment, what that's saying is that you can't take away something that has been gained, but it's not uh, making any statement about what uh, could happen in the future. In other words, I do think that that provision of the statute would, would mean that you could not... It, take away from an inmate um, good time that they have earned already by operation of law, uh, which this proposal does not attempt to do. Um, but that would make that uh, unlawful and would supersede any attempt to do so. Um, but I don't, we don't believe it speaks to future rights. Uh, it speaks to rights already accrued. So that, again, I recognize that this is a matter of statutory interpretation that will be discussed again later, but we, um, I just wanted to give the committee our reasons for why uh, we don't believe it applies in this case. And, and we do think a notwithstanding is uh, appropriate in this case, if, if the committee chooses to go in that direction. I just would like to understand, uh, I'm reading over the 2602 lewd and lascivious conduct of the child, which is on our web page. If we were to say that a person convicted of B, little b2, uh, excuse me, little b, um, what am I at? Oh, uh, 2602A, little a2. The section should not apply if the person less than 19 years old and the child is at least 15 years old and the conduct is consensual. Um, this is the old age gap, Romeo and Juliet thing. And I find that actually problematic. If the child were 15 and the guy was 20, um, that we are, are actually 19 years and one day. And the girl was 15, let's say. Um, that would put him or into this category, correct? Um, that's one of the areas where I'd, I'd like to explore as we look at the crimes. But if we were to change that law, 
how would it affect people currently sentenced? If we just said, okay, make it 14 rather than 15, how would that affect people currently sentenced for that crime? Senator, is that a question for me? Uh, either one of you, actually. Okay. I'm trying to understand this 214, uh, Title I, 214, and the other law, uh, I mean, the constitutional work. factor. It wouldn't affect anybody who's currently sentenced, um, although I, I think that uh, um, a person would have a legitimate argument to attempt to get their conviction sealed or expunged uh, based on the fact that it was uh, um, something was made uh, effectively legal that used to be illegal. Now, if um, you remember back, but, that's the way the Senate passed the bill back in 2010, I believe. Right. It was, it was a 14, was 14 and the house insisted that it be 15. But the person would have to argue that it doesn't apply the same. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's something became, their consensual act when they were convicted has been made legal subsequently. Yeah. They got the benefit of it. Senator White. So when we're looking at this list um, of crimes that we are now in this bill considering um, exempting from um, I hate to use the term good time, but that is what we're using, I guess. So um, can somebody give me, I'm still concerned that we're using categories instead of individuals here. And can somebody give me an example of just in this one that you pointed out, Senator Sears, can somebody give me an example of what L and L with a child is other than this age thing? Can somebody just give me an example of somebody who might be convicted of that? What the, is it exposing yourself in the park in the, at the playground? I mean, what is it? That could be, um, you know, touching of, the, of a person in their private areas that doesn't involve, uh, you know, could be over the clothes, could be, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But it could be exposing yourself in the park. Could be. To, at the playground. To a minor, yeah. It seems to me that um, by including this whole category that, um, anyway, um, is mooning as you go from the high school bus, football bus, is that? Lewd and lascivious, what is that? That could could be a lewd act, but not lewd and lascivious conduct with a child. With a child, but it could be lewd. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a different okay. different crime. Okay, I'm just really concerned that about um, exempting these um, from the uh, good time. Let's, let's use the, maybe we should start using the term creating disqualifying crimes. So we're saying okay. that certain crimes disqualify you from now. getting good time and okay. might be a better way to look at it than exempting, you know, we're not exempting them. We're saying um, these are disqualifying crimes and maybe we yeah. should, maybe we want to refer to this as earn time or earn credit or whatever we want to call it because we don't want to use it for good time. I would, the English professor in our midst um, might have a great word, a better I think phrase earned, for the Earn time is good. Anyway, um, so are we finished with the discussion about whether it's constitutional and whether we should not withstand S2, S2 whether we should not withstand Title I, Section 214? Uh, I, I just, and anybody, including Matt, should feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but if we do not withstand it, it makes 
the case if it's adjudicated stronger for what we would be trying to do, I believe. Um, it Matt might say ultimately it won't it won't uh, result in a successful verdict, but it would it would definitely strengthen the effort. Um, I think so. Eric, why don't you prepare a, an amendment that, I mean, pretty simple, I guess, to notwithstand something. Yep, George, you did it. You did it. Uh, you may recall having added the notwithstanding section 214 for the uh, last session when you passed the statute that was permitting uh, civil, uh, civil actions based on child sexual abuse. Remember where the statute of limitations had expired? So no, right. we can right. do something similar here, certainly. Yeah. Senator White. I have a hard time weighing in on whether we should do a withstanding or uh, declare it unconstitutional or constitutional since I'm not sure that I agree with uh, creating disqualifying crimes in the first place. So um, just throw that in. Well, so I can't uh, weigh in on the withstanding. Well. well. We can't not withstand the Constitution, so there will be a, a battle over this. But if we pass this, if we pass the bill, we cannot yeah. say notwithstanding the constitutional right. No. Um, but we can say notwithstanding uh, what's the statute. Um, we do that frequently, actually. We do it all the time in the darn budget, by the way. Um, somebody should pull up the notwithstandings in the budget every year, the big bill. Um, I, I would, uh, Eric prepared a, a list of the crimes that are disqualified, and I think we should kind of, oh, excuse me, is Chris Fenno or Sarah Robinson want to chime in here on, on any of this first discussion about the constitutionality? I'm not sure that I'm your gal for that, but, um... <laughs> Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network. I, I will just um, just broadly say that, um, you know, our, our primary concern throughout this conversation has been um, that, you know, some of the most serious crimes that took the life of or had lifelong impacts on victims, that that ought to be weighed in this process. Um, and really what I think this committee has heard from victims and certainly what we have heard from victims is that it, it's extremely important to, to victims that the promise that they felt like they had um, from the state of Vermont is honored um, in terms of people that had been previously sentenced. Um, and we do feel like the proposed language would ensure that that's, that that's the case. And in terms of um, people being sentenced moving forward, I know that you're, uh, sounds like you're about to have a conversation about which, um, crimes. which crimes may or may not um, be included. And I would just say that kind of parallel to that policy conversation, um, you know, we still absolutely believe that there ought to be some language in the bill um, to, ensure that victims are notified prior to sentencing moving forward so that victims in the future aren't in the similar place as the victims that you have heard from over the past several weeks. Um, so right now there is no absolute right to notification um, and in the conversations that victims may be having with prosecutors or victim advocates or others, they may be hearing about sentence lengths and we do think it's important that prior to their opportunity to provide a victim impact statement, they can at least um, be aware of and just be noticed of the fact that um, whatever the statutory scheme ends up looking like, good time may or is or is not a possibility um, for the person that caused them harm um, so that they are aware of that and clear about that um, moving forward from, from the time of sentencing. I suppose that, but if it was, if we didn't change any of these crimes, but well, I guess my example would be if we took manslaughter out, left murder in, and if somebody was trying to plea down to manslaughter, you're wanting the victim to be notified that if they get manslaughter, they would still occur a good time. 
That's right. I think it's fair for all the parties to just be aware um, that the yeah. sentenced crime um, may look different and victims ought to be aware of that um, in, in those considerations. Aren't they notified of that now by the victim's advocates? It's Maybe not I need help from Chris here. It's not guaranteed that they are. Uh, Chris Fennell uh, from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Uh, right now, the, the legislation that was passed, and I tested on it at the time, is that victims will be told at sentencing. So it, will, it would be explained to them what, if, what impact this might have on the sentence. And I personally think the prosecutor should, prosecutor should do that. I think it probably will fall to the victim advocates. And, um, and I think that's a little problematic too to make, they're, they're not attorneys. So uh, there might need to be some training and, and things that need to happen around that. But somebody commits a crime that's not disqualifying, they know they're gonna get good time. Yes. Um, so, I mean, there isn't an issue Um, uh, I thought we have that under the Victim's Bill of Rights. Yeah. Uh, Senator Shears, I think, I think part of the issue is that is around plea bargaining, is that uh, we heard last week from one victim's family that they <clears throat> led out to a, a lesser charge. They could have been charged with um, homicide, um, but they didn't do that because they didn't want to have to sort of rehash everything that had happened to their daughter. So knowing that if it had been, he had been actually. Uh, you're muted for some reason, Chris. Um, they said they had evidence to charge him and have his sentence be life without parole, mm -hmm. but that would have meant a trial. So they said, okay, we don't wanna rehash everything that happened to her, um, but it's just that that kind, right now, what that means is that offender who got 34 years, I think. Um, 43. 43, uh, but, Regardless of that, he he now can, because he took that plea agreement, he can now um, earn time <clears throat> off of his sentence because of that. So what what I think Sarah is alluding to is that those kinds of if if in fact S eighteen um, passes and becomes law, it's going to be really critical that um, the people who are explaining sentencing to victims understand what that means um, and that prosecutors understand what that might mean to a victim to take a plea deal and move them into a category where they might be able to earn time off. I think I understand what yeah. you're getting at. Um, I, there are I would, well, I would just note that, you know, it's not that um, victims are notified of the underlying sentence that currently happens. Um, but what would be helpful to have in the language is to ensure that victims have the right to understand, um, be notified of the potential impact of good time on the underlying sentence um, based on the offense. Smashing my mailbox. I'm serious. If somebody Sorry. smashes, do, how, what crimes are we talking? All crimes? Just in the normal course of um, the normal course of victim notification in the general court process <clears throat> right now, victims of all crimes have a right to be notified around sentencing um, of the person that caused them harm. And their primary place that they have a voice in the process is the victim impact statement. And so from our view, it's essential that they just understand, it's just clear to all parties 
um, when they are able to offer that statement about the potential impact for good time on the sentence so that a victim can speak to that and the impact that it may have for them. All right, I think I understand what you're asking. Does it mean we have to rewrite the bill? Do we have to have an amendment? I think if you want to guarantee that right for victims, there would need to be language, yes. Do you have a suggestion? I would be happy to, uh, to send you some language and I'd be happy to work with Chris on that and then send you something on behalf of both of us if that would be helpful. That would be helpful. Sure. We don't have the state's attorneys represented here today, but we do have the attorney general. Any thoughts, Mr. Attorney or Mr. Deputy Attorney General? There's Joe. Oh, Joe. No, I yeah, asked I David a question, so maybe I should. So I don't know when this started or why, but uh, for the life of me, every felony that I'm doing a sentencing on, a judge will stop the proceeding if the victim hasn't been uh, invited to the sentencing. And I don't know whether that was legislation that was passed or whether there was a rule that was imposed. I'm just, it's just dawning on me that in virtually every case, sentencing can come to a complete standstill if there isn't an official waiver by the victim for appearing at the sentencing hearing. And um, I've seen it happen several times. I don't know where it began. I don't know if that's a statute or a rule. I think it's part of the Victims' Bill of Rights. It is. Yeah, I believe so. so I don't well, that, know if that, that needs that, to be amended here or what they're suggesting, but I don't have language right now. Well, it would beg the question then, why would we want to add language to this particular bill? Well, that's... We asked them and they said they wanted it. I don't know. I mean, we, it's like it would be any amendment. Do we want to adopt it or not adopt it? That's, they are witnesses suggesting that they want to make sure victims are fully aware of how a good time law that passed two years last October would impact that victim. My, that, that's what I understand what they're asking. David? The Senator, just to answer your question and, and perhaps a couple others, the, um, we, we would support such an amendment if the committee were to uh, uh, consider it and adopt it. I, I think it goes to the core of what this bill does, which the, and the policy this bill is trying to address, which is really a notice problem more than it is uh, questioning the concept of earned good time. You know, every under this bill, everybody moving forward retains the uh, ability to get earned good time. And we support that and think that's that we, we believe in earned good time. We think that's a good thing. What this is trying to do is correct a, a very serious problem with respect to notice and fairness for uh, people uh, in the past who have already been sentenced with a, and with victims who had a certain understanding of what that sentence meant. Um, and we're trying to correct that unfairness. And I think in keeping with that, it makes sense to have uh, a guarantee of notice with respect to earn good time moving forward. Again, that's very much in line with what we're trying to achieve in this bill, which is to make sure that uh, victims have an adequate understanding of what's really happening, uh, while at the same time allowing for what we believe is a good policy change, which is to allow earn good time. And, and again, we support keeping that possible for everybody. Uh, in the future. I think it's a good balance and that this would, this addition would help ach uh, achieve that balance. I look forward to seeing something from both of you. And um, Eric, let me ask you a question. Um, you and I yeah. discussed the other day, the Texas model as an alternative here. And the Texas model is everybody still gets the good time no matter the sentence, but certain crimes all of disqualifying crimes here would not change the date of um, the parole. So in other words, while you would, could earn the time, you wouldn't change the, the parole date. Um, so it wouldn't give somebody who had a 43 year minimum any earlier parole. Right. 
Right. And I, I, we had looked at that a little bit. I, I thought the, uh, you may recall, Senator Sears, you and I discussed it. Uh, yeah. It seemed like that there was a, a more significant ex post facto problem with that approach because of the fact that um, it was clearly impacting someone's sentence by changing the date at which they could be eligible for parole. Um, and that there seemed to be a number of cases, particularly on the parole point. Uh, although, you know, I see the, the, based on what I've heard today, I think, you know, the AG or defensing, whoever would be defending the statute might argue that there's a distinction based on the fact that what comes into play is the time that the defendant was sentenced as opposed yeah. to what yeah. happened subsequently. But at least the cases I read seem to suggest that the parole, that the particular point of changing the date that someone, retro, retroactively changing the date that someone would be eligible for parole, um, seemed like the ex post facto issue was even more significant with that, if that were the approach. And that's, and as you point out, that's the approach that Texas takes. Not to say but, uh, that you, you know, it's going to get litigated anyway, no, so you, right. could, you could certainly so, try it. <laughs> no, what was another alternative? Um, yeah. James Peppers hopped on, and I wonder if you have a thought about the victims issue we were just talking about. I think you were watching us on YouTube. So, well, um, uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, James <laughs> Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So this victim notification around good time was contemplated in the uh, in the Justice Reinvestment Bill, um, Act 148. And there is a section there that maybe needs a little bit of modification, but I think um, it was at least in the contemplation of the committee that moving forward that the prosecutor would at the time of sentencing, the prosecutor's office, whether it's through the victim's advocate or from the state's attorney or prosecutor, him or herself, um, there's language that added that the prosecutor's office shall ensure that victims are made aware of the right to notification of an offender's scheduled release date pursuant to this section. So that is that was designed to begin the conversation with the victim at the time of sentencing about good time and the potential credit that could be earned against a min and a max. Um, and, and perhaps it needs some clarification. Um, and I also remember there's another section of the bill that said that DOC shall work on um, clarifying for prosecutors the potential for earning good time. So if a sentence is, you know, six to 10 um, years that the prosecutor at sentencing shall know precisely how much earn time could be earned, or how much good time could be earned at the time of sentencing. So if we want to clarify you know exactly whose responsibility it is and at what point you know that would be the section to, to do it in but i think that this is um there's at least a requirement right now um okay. for state attorneys to notify thank you so with that in mind that's very helpful pepper thank you um would it be okay to spend a few minutes we've got about a half an hour left on what the crimes would be, what, whether we agree with all the disqualifying offenses that are listed here. And again, it's on our web page, and it might be it might be easier if Peggy could. Uh, it's up to up to all of you on the committee. Uh, we could have Peggy put the crime list of the crimes up. The first one listed on my page is 501 arson causing, arson causing death. Um, would you, would committee rather have see it or do you want to? Sure, sure, that's helpful. Eric, well, you, you did, say, you did send us the bill. Yeah, but. Okay, is it, is it different than what's in the bill? No. Section C. Well, right? I mean, there's an explanation of the crime. Oh, okay, great. Okay, yes. Is the actual statute. Okay. Right. Do you want me to do it, or do you want to? Do you want to do it? If it has an explanation, Ooh. put it up, please. Ooh. That would be helpful. Oh, let me see. So Hold on. Page. If you go to page four of the bill, C. Mm -hmm. 
and it says, as used in this section, disqualifying offense means line 13, arson causing death. But then Eric has posted what exactly the statute is that you're um, considering disqualifying. I would love to see that. Okay, so why don't we post that? Um, it's it's posted, but I just pulled it up. Okay, okay. can you do a one pager? Or? Yeah. No, I meant the thing that's on our web page that pro that Eric provided. Isn't this uh, it? That disqualifying. This is it. This is no, it. That's yeah, there the it is. Bill. Oh yes, it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. Can you just do one page at a time, or and make it a little bigger? Uh, let's see. I don't know. That's how we came up when I posted it. Hold on. Let me see if I can figure this out. Sorry. Look at. Do the, the type size up uh, How's that? up above. Hold on, guys. I think I might be able to do it. Hold on. Uh, crap. How's that? Eric? That's, That's better. Okay. Good. That's much better. Thank you. You're welcome. A person who willfully and maliciously burns the building of another or willfully and maliciously sets fire to a building owned in whole or in part by himself or herself, by means of which the life of a person is lost, shall be guilty of murder. Can I ask uh, Eric a question about this? Absolutely. Eric, um, as, as I'm just reading this uh, little synopsis, it seems as though the loss of life could be completely unintentional, is that? Eric, can you hear me? I have a feeling, Eric, because I he never I answered Eric. me either. Okay. So maybe he's, well, he's I'll, for a second. I'll just put that out there. Oh, wait, can you hear me? Can you hear oh, me now? Yeah, yes. we can hear you now. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about that. But the, uh, the, I understood the question, Senator Baruth, and uh, the you you not might not necessarily intend to kill the person by setting the fire. That's yeah. true, but the use of the terms you'll see it's willfully and maliciously burns the building of another. So you have to intentionally set fire to the place, and maliciously means there is some bad intent. In other words, it's not just that you accidentally burned, you know, no, I, some matches. I I definitely see that, but. Um, it seems to me there's a distinction to be made between somebody who says, uh, you know, my neighbor that I've been having uh, a property dispute with, I'm going to burn down his shed or a, a building he has, doesn't know that the person is in there. Right. Um, so is it true that the law makes no distinction in, in that case? I think in that case, right, you could, you know, for example, the fact pattern you described, that could potentially be an arson causing death situation. Because this goes back to Senator White's point about, you know, um, disqualifying people and, and the purpose of prison as a, as a reformatory system. If, if death resulted not through any intent of the person, then, then in my mind, what they intended to do was arson, which is, mm -hmm. you know, don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a horrible crime, but should that disqualify that person from ever receiving any benefit if they can demonstrate reformation? So that's, that's one that, that's the only piece of that that I stumble over, whereas murder in the first degree, you've, you've, or premeditated murder, you've adjudicated it and proven that the person planned to do it and then did it. Um, so I just throw that out there as a asterisk over arson causing death for me. And I, I think just to follow up on that, Senator Baruch, the, if yeah. you look at, if you pay, if you were looking exactly at fir first degree murder, as you just were pointing out the next paragraph down under 2301. Yeah. One, one of the ways in which first degree murder is possible is in fact, if you murdered someone while committed uh, in perpetrating or attempting to perpetrate arson. See, that's that okay. third line. So I think that covers the intentional situation, which yes, I'm intending, I'm intentionally 
taking the life of another person okay, by and, fire. So, And the reasoning would be that if you intentionally do that crime or kidnapping, you're creating such a dangerous situation that you should know somebody could die in doing it. I think that's, that's yep, you've described what's known in the law as felony murder, but that's exactly okay. right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. I agree with Philip on the, um, the arson one. I, I think that if somebody burns down the garden shed of their neighbor and it, they just happen to be asleep in the garden shed, that that really isn't, in my mind, premeditated murder. It's arson. Could be a lot says. clearer. It could be a lot easier to see if you recognize the language could result in somebody running out to hose down the garden shed while it's burning and then the garden shed collapses on them. The same could apply in this particular situation. I don't, I agree. I don't think this should be in this exclusion category. Okay. Is that a majority opinion? An apparent majority. An apparent no, majority. I could be in there, but to go along, okay. Uh, murder, first and second degree um, penalties. Well, actually, murder defined. Section 2301. Yeah. What does, uh, may I ask a question? No. What does, or a wanton under second degree, or a wanton disregard of the likelihood that death or great bodily harm would result? So we're lumping in great bodily harm with death here? No. In murder? It says, or great bodily harm is a is second to degree. to do great or, bodily harm. Huh? You, the person didn't die, but there was an intent to kill the person. That's how I read it. Or it's, um, it says... Eric, can you answer the question? I think it means that that the possibilities for the second degree murder charge, uh, that you, you intend to kill the person, that's the first clause, or you intend to do great bodily harm, but the person dies anyway. You still have to have the death, but your intent was to do great bodily harm. Or by wanton disregard, that's generally a, uh, a another way to phrase recklessness. So that's your, it's more than negligence. Because uh, you'll see negligent, negligently causing the death of another person can be a manslaughter charge, but one to disregard is generally reckless. You conscious disregard of a known risk. You know that something is risky. You do it anyway. Um, you know that death or serious bodily harm could result from what you do, but you do it anyway. Push um, them off a cliff. Right. <laughs> That's a good example. So, <laughs> so my I'm question sorry, is... I didn't catch that, Alice. Then you push them off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> By some miracle they live, but you and So my it. question is, is it considered second degree murder if the person doesn't die, but they have suffered great bodily harm? No, but it could be attempted second degree murder. If the person doesn't die, you can't have a murder if the person didn't die, but it could be attempted. So where is attempted? Second attempts are in a separate, separate statute, but it okay. generally All speaking, right, attempts you. are. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Sure. I think it should. If anything should be in there, this should. That should be in there. My opinion. I agree. Explain the difference between voluntary and involuntary manslaughter. Yes, Peggy, would you be, can you hear me? Would you be able to move the page down, please? So that the, uh, you want to have voluntary, mm -hmm. yep. Okay, a little bit more. Actually, actually, that's fine. That's perfect. Because 
Now you can see in front of you, I think, does everybody see that you have bolded both voluntary and involuntary manslaughter? Yes. yes. Right. So, uh, so the difference is um, whether or not there's been an intent uh, to, to take human life, essentially, the, the difference between voluntary manslaughter and involuntary. You see that voluntary manslaughter is an intentional unlawful killing of another human being, but uh, it's committed when, under sudden passion or great provocation uh, that mitigates the killing. So that's, you know, a situation where, um, uh, you know, someone's emotions have risen to the level of sudden passion or provocation. Uh, in that case, uh, it's very common and long been held in the law that there, those are mitigating factors uh, to the taking of another life. So uh, perhaps makes it, uh, ameliorates the culpability, essentially, not as culpable because of the existence of this provocation, the person's been provoked or some rise in the passion. Um, and that can uh, reduce a charge of murder to voluntary manslaughter. And you see this, this language here is from the model jury instructions, which I took from the Vermont Bar Association's webpage. Um, now, involuntary ma manslaughter, on the other hand, you see, look down to the next paragraph, is, is, is an un unlawful killing. So in other words, it's not justified. It's not self-defense or something like that. But it's not done with the intent to take human life. So you, you, you cause the death of another person, but you didn't intend to do so. You see the second sentence, it's an unintentional killing where the person acts either recklessly by disregarding, and, then, and again, I said earlier, recklessness is conscious disregard of a known risk. You know something is risky and you engage in the conduct anyway, or it could be criminal negligence. You see, that's the second bracketed phrase. Could be, you, you acted unintentionally killed somebody, but you acted negligently. You know, you acted unreasonably under the circumstances. Um, you, uh, you're, you had a duty of care and uh, your, your reasonableness under the circumstances to, to take care, uh, you failed to do so. And if you do that and um, accidentally cause the death of another person, then it can be involuntary manslaughter. You see the penalties as well, I included there just so you could see that the, the penalties for manslaughter are much, much uh, lower and the penalties for murder. It's only a, a one year minimum, 15 year maximum, whereas the murder penalties are 35 years to life. So significantly different because obviously the, the culpability uh, in the two situations is very different. Does that okay. sort of help understand the concept? Yeah. I, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. But, they're, but they're both included under number three. It doesn't give you any option with regard to voluntary or involuntary, is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Senator Nick. Thanks. Yeah. It seems, right. oh, that, that's a good explanation right. of it. I'm not sure it belongs or doesn't belong. I'm happy to hear arguments from those that are in the, um, oh. in the room right now which includes committee members as well as um, the judge, state attorney, victims group, Matt Valerio. I would say it doesn't belong. Okay. I certainly think voluntary does belong, but it's not separating out the two. Well, can I just um, ask a question about a, uh, what, what would be the result of this issue? somebody goes to confront somebody that they have been um that has been bullying them insist consistently bullying them and they go with a gun with the intention of confronting the person and then shooting themselves because they're so depressed in the process the person begins his bullying again and continues to bull and bull and bull and the person loses it and shoots him. Now, it seems to me that that's voluntary manslaughter because it's in the height of a passion. And he, there wasn't, he never had an intent to shoot that other person. But it's included under here as, a, uh, as something that can't be, can't, um, be qualified for. Is that my understanding, Eric, is that that's the way that would work? That would be voluntary manslaughter. 
Uh, I, I think uh, my reading of it is that what, what you described, that could be provocation. And that's the word. So that conceivably could be a voluntary manslaughter situation. I think I'd also defer to Matt and David with more experience in practice with this than I, but- I wonder certainly. if anybody, um, David, Matt, or um, Pepper, or folks from the victim, I can't see everybody right now, so. The, the cases that I've handled like this that have uh, uh, the voluntary manslaughter, you're really looking at the difference between voluntary manslaughter and second degree as more than voluntary manslaughter and involuntary manslaughter. Um, what tends to happen is if you have a, what would otherwise be a second degree murder where you have great provocation or sudden passion, it reduces the second degree murder to a voluntary manslaughter. And these arise a lot, oftentimes, there are a bunch of different ways it arises. One of the ways it arises is somebody gets in, involved in a, in a mutual fight and then uses excessive force to try to um, extricate themselves from the fight or the like, and, and somebody dies as a result. So, you know, it's kind of the, uh, you know, somebody pull somebody pulls a knife during a fist fight. Somebody, you know, there's a there's a big brawl going on, and somebody picks up a baseball bat and hits somebody in the head or something, and they end up dying as a result. Now they didn't intend to kill them, uh, but the provocation was there as a result of of the fight. The other thing that's kind of the typical one that you, you hear about is somebody comes home and finds somebody in bed with their wife. Um, and so they, you know, go start beating on the, the guy or whatever it is. And, um, and that's the uh, sudden passion where you don't have an, in, an intent necessarily to kill, but that you, but the person ends up dying as a result of that. Um, there's cases down in the Wyndham County area. I, I recall one that uh, one of our guys did, um, where there was a fight outside a bar. Um, a guy got, mm -hmm. a guy got punched in the head and fell on the side of the curb, hit his head and he ended up, uh, the, the guy who fell ended up dying. Um, that is a, another example of maybe the distinction between voluntary manslaughter and involuntary manslaughter. Um, involuntary manslaughter is of course very, uh, is, is pure, really a almost pure negligence situation where there was no intent to, uh, uh, to kill or even to understand that what you were doing might have resulted um, in the death. It's a mistake that results in the death of somebody else. Um, and uh, that's, you know, to me, that I, I would definitely push that out of there, and I, I feel the same way about voluntary manslaughter. Only because the issue is not the issue. Really, is is what are you trying to deter in the conduct? You you, you can't deter an unintentional act. Um, you know, you can't if the if the intent wasn't to cause the death or if placed in the same or similar situation, um, the the death was the accident, even if the act was intentional. Um, you know, it's uh, it implicates what we call imperfect self-defense type arguments, where somebody maybe reasonably believes or they believe that they have to use a certain level of force, but they overreacted. Um, you can end up in a question, you know, the, the, on the edge of voluntary manslaughter versus second degree murder. Um, if a jury finds voluntary manslaughter, if the pleas to voluntary manslaughter, what you're saying is that it's something less than a unmitigated attempt to kill um, or intention to kill. So, um, you know, I gave you some examples. I have said before that I think the manslaughter should be out um, and the I understand second degree, first degree murder if it goes if it goes this route. And remember, what you're doing here is excluding somebody from the opportunity to have, uh, or pr it, it allows them to get good time. You're not changing their, you know, their. Mm -hmm. It's not the sentence that's being impacted. It's their eligibility for release 
um, at the time of, uh, you know, with good time off the minimum. Um, so, Thank, you know, thanks, I, Matt. That's the that's the key. So. David, sure. Is there a reason manslaughter was in here, and if so, why should we keep it? Uh, thanks, Senator. You know, the, the the list was originally generated as one that was an attempt to focus on the most serious crimes in Vermont, um, you know, the, the catalog of Vermont crimes. And uh, in developing that list, we looked to the Big 12, but we felt that the Big 12 was actually too many and we wanted to reduce <coughs> our reliance on those pre-existing lists. Um, so we took a subsection of the Big 12, there's eight here, um, a couple of them actually are, are not from the Big 12, but fall within the sort of category of the very serious crimes, including uh, aggravated sexual assault on a child. The, um, it, you know, I think it's important to remember for something like this, uh, these are still crimes where there's somebody has lost their life and somebody's lost a family member. And I, I also want to emphasize, and that's that's a very serious loss. You know, it's not, we're not talking about purely accidental behavior where there would not be any crime uh, involved. Um, and the other thing I want to emphasize here is what the committee is doing is a relatively narrow thing in that all they are, all you're doing, all you're guaranteeing that you'll do by passing this bill is that people who have already been sentenced and with a particular understanding of what that's and the victims had a particular understanding of what that sentence was the family members of the people who died in this case had a particular understanding of what that sentence was those people are going to retain the same sentence they had before again in the future the bill does allow for anybody to to uh, get earned good time so i just want to re-emphasize that that we are talking about past sentences here not that this committee is going to drastically reform how sentences will be granted in the future Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody oh. else who wants to speak on this? So, Senator Sears, can I just say, uh, so if I understood Matt right from before, the manslaughter sentence, is it true, Matt? It's a 50, only, only, but it's a 15 year maximum? Yes. So. $3,000 fine or in prison for not less than one year, not more than 15. So somebody could actually get a one year to a one year sentence. Jeez. It, it's not unusual in close cases like this to even see just suspended sentences. Even on the voluntary? Eh, not so much on the voluntary. I mean, those are, those are typically, you know, you see five to 15s the real serious, if, if it looked like, there's some that look more like involuntary manslaughters than voluntary manslaughters. And those are the ones that are gonna get the, the five to 15 if they're voluntary. There are others that look more like second degree murder, but end up as voluntary manslaughters. And those are gonna get the ones that are like 10 to 15 or like the higher, hmm. higher minimums. Either the victim's community members here want to speak or James Pepper? Are they all still on? I don't know. Sarah, I can't, Sarah, I can't Kevin's see. there. <laughs> Sarah. Um, oh. Yes, I, I'll just say um, on what you have covered so far that, you know, we, we supported the bills that were identified by the Attorney General exactly for the reasons that um, <clears throat> the Assistant Attorney General outlined. Um, that it it was a narrower subset of bills, um, not the big 12, that these were um, bills that had really lifetime impacts on the victims. Thank you. And I would concur with that. This is Chris Fenno. Um, the list came out of the attorney general's office. It seemed reasonable. Uh, I am a little concerned because I thought this wasn't gonna just be applying to pass, but also to forward? Yes. So it, it has no effect on somebody who, co who commits first degree murder now. If, if I could just clarify. No, it will, that, no, yeah, no, no, it will affect anybody who does it now. We focused in terms of the ex post facto and those other things we focused on 
those who are currently sentenced. Right. But the, if the bill passes, it would affect everybody who's sentenced after the date of, or actually, the, I don't know if it, the date of the crime, the date of the sentence. David? I just wanted to clarify, there is, the bill does contemplate a, a petition process for right. these crimes going forward. So everybody retains the ability to get it. They don't have a guarantee of getting it uh, as the bill is currently drafted. Right. May I ask David a question about that? This is mm. Jeanette. <clears throat> so uh, um, you just said that this would allow them to going forward to petition, but isn't that the same for the past? It allows them nothing in this, um, um, in what we passed before says that anybody's sentence will be reduced. It says that they, the date by which they can petition for a, or have a hearing might be moved forward or backward, whichever you want to call it. But it doesn't guarantee that they're going to be released. It just guarantees that they will have a got, hearing at which anybody can come and testify about why you, they should or should not. And I'm you're talking I'm about two separate processes. You're talking about the parole process. You're yeah. correct. Somebody who's currently sentenced, when they get up, come up for parole, they don't automatically get parole. Right. But he's talking about a petition process that would take place before the court if you were sentenced after the effective date of this and you committed one of these crimes or convicted of one of these crimes, you could petition to earn good time. And that's how the bill reads. But wouldn't you still have to then go before the somebody to, um, so you yeah. can petition to get the good time, but just because you get it doesn't mean that you're going to be released when you still have to go before somebody and yes. have a hearing. Yeah. Okay, that, that's my question. This would be an earlier date that you'd be able to right. get the hearing than you would right. otherwise. But it doesn't guarantee anything except no. an earlier hearing. Right. Yeah. So the question was, should we keep manslaughter in? No. One no. Two no's. Two no. Three no's. Three no's. I'd say okay. yes. I'd say yes with the fact that I'd rather it was just voluntary kept in. But. Okay. Well, it's three to one to one. What's I, the I'm, what's the one? I haven't voted yet. <laughs> oh. I. I, I agree with you. It would be better if voluntary work. Can, can't we just write it that way? Well, we could. But involuntary I, manslaughter. I don't know. There's, with three votes, to take all manslaughter out. Oh, okay. No. Kidnapping. Peggy, can we move down a little bit? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Is there anybody currently incarcerated for kidnapping? We do get those cases. I know I'm assigning them on occasion to the prisoners, or I mean, to the uh, serious felony units when they come up because of the potential for life in prison in them. A lot of times uh, they are pled, they're charged as kidnappings and pled to something else. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's a, uh, you see them arise a lot of times in uh, domestic cases and sexual assault cases where somebody is held for even a small, a small amount of time during the, uh, during the assault. And then it's hard <clears throat> to try to enhance or the yeah. state's bargaining power, basically. The my question, though, was, is there anybody currently sentenced who would be impacted by this? I'm sure there is, actually. It, it, there's it, not many of all of these. I mean, you're talking about a couple of handfuls, maybe, yeah. if you yeah. added them all together. 
Can no. I ask Matt a question? Sure. Did, did you say that um, there are cases where, and I see here the um, B, that where somebody uh, temporarily holds someone in some kind of a standoff or whatever it is and holds them temporarily as a hostage and then releases them that they can be um, charged with kidnapping? Is that what you said? Yes, because there's, there's kidnapping and there's unlawful restraint and it's, they're different charges. But oftentimes what you'll find, you, you can do that, but people think of kidnapping, you know, they think of, you know, the Lindbergh baby or something. That's not, that is, you know, clearly kidnapping, but kidnapping also can be holding somebody for a, a small amount of time, you know, li literally a, a, some number of minutes um, can result in a kidnapping charge. Um, you know, it's obviously serious, but they they arise a lot in domestic cases and, and sexual assaults where um, the perpetrator is not letting the person go during the course of the assault. And then you get a, a, a charge on top of your domestic or sex case of kidnapping um, to up the ante. I, I would support keeping kidnapping in. I would too. It's such a wide range, but it's horrible. It is just, it's a wide range. I just would, well, if somebody is holed up in a, in an apartment and they have somebody there and they're not hurting them, but they're not letting them go, it seems to me they shouldn't be being charged with kidnap, but if they eventually let them go, but that's, I, I don't understand our criminal justice system at all. It makes no sense to me. It just Actually, makes, you, you do. It makes no sense to me the way we, the way we charge and treat and define things and, but, and anyway. But this is what they're sentenced to for. Yeah. Well. So if, if they hold them for 15 minutes, then they're going to be charged with kidnapping that doesn't they may make be any charged sense. with it they may be charged with it but what will they be sentenced to well uh we're gonna pick up here next tuesday um and we i'm gonna suggest that we uh pick up with lewd and lascivious conduct with a child um and eric if you could um just find out um for us, I, I really, um, I really need. I, it's been a while since I've gone over L and L with a child, and um, we've got jury instructions and all of that, reporter's notes. So it might be helpful for us to have a um, thorough foundation of L and L with a child, um, because it can involve. Of lots of different scenarios, right? Could Eric send that maybe to a, whatever he comes up with to us in an email, and then I can print it off. So, because it's so hard for me to read it yeah. on the screen. If well, I, yeah, I mean, okay. I, I think that's going to be one of the couple ones. I already identified a two. The section shall not apply if the person's less than nineteen and the child is 15 but if the person's mm -hmm. 19 years old in one day and the child's 15 there could be charged with l l conduct with a child <clears throat> or if the child is 14 in 364 days um, yeah that sounds good and also just on that point senator Sears, you're you may recall that you used a different age gap in the sex offender registry statute I only point that out to say that you can you can certainly adjust that for purposes of the good time law if you wanted to, okay. without without adjusting the underlying offense. I mean, right, right. I, I know I get position body. Right. If you could remind us of what we did in the sex offender registry. 
Yeah, sure. I'll put that in the in the uh, summary. Um, does everybody um, and are there any of the, the sexual assault versus aggravated sexual assault? June. I have to look at which we, I'd like to look at the definitions of each. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm asking Eric to do is a little summary for us. Yeah. Those ones in, in the in the document you have are pretty straightforward. Um, okay. Much clearer than the L and L with the child. All right. So you can you can see the sexual assault. It's just it's limited to only two two types of the sexual assault violation, either without consent or or sorry, th three threat or coercion or placing the other person in fear that they're going to suffer imminent bodily injury. So um, you don't have, you don't have the same sort of lascivious uh, sort of terms that are open to interpretation that you have in the LNL statute. Okay. Um, so my plan is. Senator, my... yes, by then you should have your title 13 because Toby, Tony mailed it yesterday. Great. Thank you. So my plan is to take this up again next Tuesday, same format. Um, and hopefully, um, oh, my printer's out of paper. <laughs> and hopefully, um, we'll be able to um, move this bill forward um, on Tuesday. <clears throat> or not. So, uh, if, Mr. Chair, I just want to oh, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say, um, to reiterate my feeling, I got a little confused about uh, what David Sher was saying. He was referring to it as the, though the bill going forward um, included everybody. I understood the bill is introduced to continue the exclusions going forward. Yes. And I, and I had said that I could vote for something that was excluding retroactively, but not prospectively. So I just wanted to clarify that. Right. Yeah, you, you would support dealing with those that have already been sentenced, but not those that... That have yet to be sentenced. Yet to be sentenced. Yeah. I remember that. Okay. All right, I was so... Just, sorry. We've got some difficult decisions to make. First of all, what does the final draft look like? And then if we <clears throat> want to amend it further, to, to uh, Senator Bruce's position, or do we want to go forward with the Attorney General's position? Um, I just, I didn't quite hear Phil, uh, what Phil wanted. You wanted to apply to before and after. No, no so, so um, I had asked, the attorney general, when he testified, why the, why it wasn't just excluding those offenses where there had been an agreement prior to passage of the bill on on the length of the sentence, if if the purpose of the bill was to keep good faith with victims, um, because going forward everybody would be informed that all categories would be eligible for good time. Does that make sense, Alice? So you're comfortable with just going forward, trying to no. ascertain that. Just doing the past. You want to do the past and the present and the future. I mean, the past and no. the future. No. The, oh, bill the, does, future. the bill does everybody who's sentenced in the future, as well as those currently sentenced. Right. On the effective date of the bill. OK. What I think Senator Baruth's talking about is only making it effective for those where a deal was made, the victims were involved, yeah. and in the future, the victim would know be that informed. The, yeah. be informed of the good time that the person might receive, and it would be a different, there hadn't been an agreement. Yeah, I understand. So, yeah. okay. That's what... Okay, good. We'll see. Thank you.